Yeah, I don't think there's really any greater form of love than being able to adopt a child. I mean, I've had uh, uh, Jesse Barrett, Amy Coney Barrett's uh, husband on the podcast here. They adopted two kids from Haiti. And, and I've also had, um, you know, other gay dads on the podcast, uh, Perez Hilton, David Berker. Those guys chose to go through the surrogacy process uh, in order to become uh, fathers. So why did you guys decide to go uh, adoption uh, as opposed to, say, going through a surrogacy process? And what was the adoption process like for you? Yeah, you know, it's funny that before I get to that, that you mentioned the Amy Coney Barrett thing, because I remember when she was nominated for the Supreme Court and liberals and Democrats were kind of assembling against her, trying to find anything they could find to demean and disparage her. Ibram Kendi and a few other people actually tried to use the fact that she had adopted her and her husband two unwanted parentless children from Haiti against her as though that was some kind of bad mark on her character. I don't think I've ever quite been as infuriated by any political attack in my life, obviously, because I do regard adoption as one of the most beautiful things. So, you know, I think um, in part it was, I honestly, I didn't really, I didn't think we were prepared to go through infancy, which is an obviously much more grueling part of raising children. But I think we would have done that. For me, what it came down to is the fact that just in Brazil alone, just in Brazil alone, to say nothing of the rest of the world, there are 60,000 children, 60,000 in shelters without parents, um, the vast majority of whom are above six years old, which means they're unlikely to be adopted because most parents want younger children. And so I just didn't feel right about um, if we were going to, you know, find a way to adopt and become parents going through this huge process um, to create a child when I knew there were loving children who needed a home, who needed parents, and that we were equipped to provide one. So for me, that that became the kind of decisive factor. Very well said. What's doing, everybody? Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. I'm Alec Lace. And before I hit you with today's interview, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the link in the description so you can listen to all of the interviews I've done with so many tremendous dads, including Dana White, Deion Sanders, Tony Hawk, and so many others. Now let's get going with today's interview. Uh, joining me now, First Class Father, Glenn Greenwald. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. It's great to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Let's start like this. How many kids do you have? How old are they? So we have, uh, my husband and I have two children, uh, both boys, Joao Vitor, who is 14, and Jonathan, who is 12. And we also have a uh, guardianship of our now 17-year-old nephew, Marcelo Enrique, who we co-raise with his mother, who lives about 45 minutes away from us. So we basically count him as a third kid as well. Wow, very cool. What kind of sports or activities are they all into? Well, they're Brazilian, so needless to say, soccer, what they call football, is a religion for them. I have always been very interested in tennis, so I always had this dream that one of my children would be a professional tennis player. So I've lured them into tennis. They like it. They don't love it. Um, but they do play. Uh, they play with they've started playing with me. But football, what they you know, soccer is far and away the number one sport for them. Well, good luck with the tennis dream there. If you, if you could, Glenn, please just take a minute to hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do. Sure. So um, I was born in the U.S. I, in South Florida. I was actually born in New York, but my parents moved to South Florida where I grew up when I was an infant. Um, I then went to college in Washington, law school in New York, worked for about 10 years as a constitutional lawyer in New York um, and had decided I was looking for a change in my life. So I rented an apartment in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil for about seven weeks to come and kind of figure out what I wanted to do with my life uh, in 2005. And on the first day, that first full day I was here, I met my now husband of 17 years, David Miranda. Um, we fell in love. Uh, at the time, he couldn't get a green card because there was a law called the Defense of Marriage Act in the US that barred gay couples from getting immigration rights because of their marriage. So we were kind of forced to live together in Brazil. We built a life here. We adopted two children together. He's now a member of Congress. I changed careers from lawyer to journalist, um, and we've built our family here. Wow, incredible stuff, Glenn. So take me back then. So uh, about how old were you then when you first uh, became a dad and how did becoming a father change your perspective on life? So it was about four years ago now. So I was 49 
which obviously is older than most people. And it was because I had never really conceived of myself as a father. It was not ever something I thought I was going to be able to do growing up as a gay kid. In the 80s, it just wasn't part of the vision I had for what my life was going to be. It took a while for my husband to persuade me that I would be a good father, that we could fit that into our lives in a way that uh, would be good for everybody. And so, you know, I did do it later in life than most people. And I, it's by far the best decision I've ever made. You know, it. I remember the argument my husband finally made to convince me uh, when I was already kind of being broken down by friends and by him. But he essentially said, you know, look, you have had this career that two careers, in fact, that checks off every box of everything you ever wanted to achieve. And we have stability and your work is well known, you know, but you're not even 50 yet. What are you planning on doing for the next 35 or 40 years? Just more of the same? Or do you want to have a new experience? Do you want to kind of have a experience of being part of a bigger family? And, you know, I thought about it and I said, you know, he's absolutely right. I mean, I'm at the time in my life where, you know, I, I feel like it's something I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do. And I figured, you know, what's the worst that can happen if, if you get, if, if we adopt kids and I'm not the best father ever, you know, at least I'll have given kids an opportunity that they deserve in life just to have a stable home. Um, but almost immediately it became this incredible passion for me. It balanced my life in so many ways. It reoriented my view of what actually matters of what, when I wake up in the morning is actually the thing that matters most to me, which isn't my work or my career or material gain, but how, you know, this unit of, of family that we've created, how we're all connecting to each other, how we're all doing is, and it really made my life so much more complete and really expanded the scope of how I think about people and things and my own existence on the planet. Very well said, Glenn. And one thing I always talk about is the fatherless crisis that we have going on in America. We have so many kids that are growing up without a father or a father figure in their life. Um, so, and, and there's so many kids that could use that opportunity to be given to them uh, to have a father in their life. So I, I think, um, I mean, like I said, I, I harp on it quite a bit here. In my opinion, I think it's the number one social issue we have going on is the breakdown of the nuclear family units and the fatherless crisis that we have going on. I think it, that that's having such a devastating toll on our society. What's your take? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. You know, um, I grew up raised by a single mother, um, although my father, you know, was around. He lived an hour away, but I was the child of of divorce. Um, they they divorced when I was six or, or seven. Um, and so I had a father in my life, but very distant, you know, one that I saw every other weekend or something. And I felt like I definitely missed out a lot because of that. Um, and my husband was the same way. He never actually knew his father. He was raised only by his mother who died when he was sort of young. And I think that was a big part of what we set out to do was to give our kids this kind of parental guidance, paternal guidance, um, that we both ended up lacking in our lives due to circumstances beyond our control. And I've seen this profound change in our kids from the time we adopted them. You know, they were in a shelter. They had no parents. Um, their mother died. Their father was taken away. There was denied custody of the of them by the state because he didn't uh, have the capacity to care for himself, let alone children. And the change in them from the time that they got here, when they were still good kids and smart, but very, very lost and kind of aimless and directionless, just four years later, having, you know, kind of... Um, of two fathers that they look up to that can give them advice that can guide them that can help them understand their role in the world has completely transformed them into different children unrecognizable from what they were four years ago and that's why it's so gratifying yeah i don't think there's really any greater form of love than being able to adopt a child i mean i've had uh, uh, jesse barrett amy coney barrett's uh, husband on the podcast here they adopted two kids from haiti and, and i've also had um you know other gay dads on the podcast uh, perez hilton david burker those guys chose to go through the surrogacy process uh in order to become uh, uh fathers so why did you guys decide to go uh, adoption uh as opposed to say going through a surrogacy process and what was the adoption process like for you yeah, you know, it's funny that before I get to that, that you mentioned the Amy Coney Barrett thing, because I remember when she was nominated for the Supreme Court and liberals and Democrats were kind of assembling against her, trying to find anything they could find to demean and disparage her. Ibram Kendi and a few other people actually tried to use 
the fact that she had adopted her and her husband two unwanted parentless children from Haiti against her as though that was some kind of bad mark on her character. I don't think I've ever quite been as infuriated by any political attack in my life, obviously, because I do regard adoption as one of the most beautiful things. So, you know, I think um, in part it was, I honestly, I didn't really, I didn't think we were prepared to go through infancy, which is an obviously much more grueling part of raising children. But I think we would have done that. For me, what it came down to is the fact that just in Brazil alone, just in Brazil alone, to say nothing of the rest of the world, there are 60,000 children, 60,000 in shelters without parents, um, the vast majority of whom are above six years old, which means they're unlikely to be adopted because most parents want younger children. And so I just didn't feel right about um, if we were going to you know, find a way to adopt and become parents, going through this huge process um, to create a child when I knew there were loving children who needed a home, who needed parents, and that we were equipped to provide one. So for me, that that became the kind of decisive factor. Very well said. And what about as far as uh, discipline goes in your house here, Glenn? What type of disciplinarian are you as a dad? And is that different than the discipline style that you grew up with? You know, it's funny. I um, My politics are very anti-authoritarian. Um, I grew up frequently rebelling against all kinds of authority and am a big believer in things like individual autonomy. So when my kids first got in, 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 into our house, it was very difficult for me to do things like punish them or impose rules because it was so contrary to my nature. My husband was much more kind of a rigorous disciplinarian with them. Um, and I ultimately came to realize that although I was interpreting the lack of discipline as some sort of kind of expression of love for them. I go, I don't want to see them suffer. I don't want to see them cry. Actually, I was doing a huge disservice to them. Kids need discipline. They want discipline. They need and want structure. It's a crucial part of their learning. It's the way they actually end up being safe. And, uh, you know, I, I had to get myself to be a disciplinarian. I mean, my husband's a member of Congress, so he's half the time in Brasilia. So I am here alone with the kids. So if they do something wrong, if they break a, a rule, if they're not studying, you know, although it would be easier for me to be the nice dad, you know, the one who plays around with them and jokes around with them, that would be um, a, a kind of a breach of my responsibility. So I really come to not only learn how to do it, but to feel very comfortable. Um, but I think the key for me is in general in life, but also as a parent, the authority can't be arbitrary. You know, you can't punish them because you're in a bad mood or because they're annoying you. One of the most important things that I try and do is when I do punish them, maybe not in the moment when they're angry and, you know, kicking and screaming or whatever, but ultimately, you know, within an hour or so, I sit down with them and I explain to them what the rationale of the punishment was, why the punishment was justified, what my thought process was behind it. So they realize there's a, a, a consistent fairness to the system and it's not just this kind of arbitrary punishment. And that's that's how I handle it. Yeah. And, and on that, too, Glenn, like I remember growing up, my parents didn't seem to do that. Like I don't remember my father ever one apologizing to me for anything or ever sitting me down and explaining to me why I was punished. And he never seemed to feel guilty about it. When, when, I, when I'm punishing my kids or we're, you know, d d taking things away or I feel like a little guilty for doing it. I fight through it. You know, my wife and I will go back and forth, especially with my daughter. Uh, I definitely have to improve my discipline skills with her because I'm very soft on her in certain ways. So uh, it, but I feel that guilt. And I, I always wonder, like, did, did my parents ever feel that way, you know, because it seemed like they had no, now my father had me when he was 50 years old. So he came from a different school of, of uh, discipline and a different generation. So it didn't seem like he ever felt bad for the punishments that were being handed out. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm the same way. I mean, I, you know, especially because my father was a little bit more distant. He was the disciplinarian. When I did something wrong, my mother would call him. He would be the one to come over. And a lot of times it was, it, it, it seemed like it was coming from a place of anger. And uh, when you feel like you're being punished, not out of love, but out of anger, and there's no sense at all about the impact it's having on you, I think you can come to resent it. I know I did. You know, and it was only later on in life when I realized that it wasn't that my father was actually doing it out of any kind of negative emotion. I don't think he had the capacity to communicate. Maybe men 
of his generation, you know, he was born during World War II, were taught that communicating is not necessarily something men are expected to do or should do. Um, so I think it was just more that he lacked the ability to do that. And it took me a long time to come to appreciate the fact that by punishing me, he, it was his way of trying to improve my life and show up, but I don't think it was done the right way. So I think, you know, all of us, I know talking to my friends, I think all of us as parents try and think about what our own childhood experience was like and what are the mistakes our own parents made. Cause of course we're all going to make mistakes as parents. There's no such thing as being a perfect parent. It's way too difficult for that. And one of the things I try and do is avoid my parents' mistakes and how I raise my own kids. And so that kind of communication is, I think my way of trying to avoid having them react to the punishment or, or assertion of discipline the way that I did. And you know, the other thing is, it's funny that you say that, you know, feeling guilty and the like with your daughter, I do think kids, you know, they get to know you very well and they know how to manipulate you. They're, they're, oh, I know one of the things I realized is kids are much more clever than I ever understood. They know that you love them. They know where your soft spot is, you know, and I've seen before my own kids kind of cry on cue in order to make me feel guilty about the fact that I took away their phone or, you know, barred them from playing video games for a few days because of a bad grade. I still feel bad about it. Um, but you know, as you said, you've kind of got, got to work through that because ultimately that is your role as a parent. You, you can be their friend, but you have to be an authority figure as well. They are persistent. I mean, they'll ask for an ice cream cone. You tell them no, a half hour later, they're licking on one, you know? So they, they, they're definitely, uh, they definitely stay persistent. I think there's definitely been an evolution of fathers, uh, over the years here too. He's no longer that stereotypical dad who comes home from work and knocks down a glass of scotch and just is disconnected from the family. There's definitely been an evolution of that from the many dads that I, that I've spoken to too on a podcast. So, uh, and, and just jumping into what you do right now, the journalism world, it just seems as if, um, I don't know, journalism has been hijacked here by a, a agendas from all sorts of ways. It doesn't seem like we get that that kind of old school scoop like we used to seem to get on the news. So what what is your take on what's going on in the world of journalism right now? And what advice do you have for the parents out there who have kids that are trying to pursue or interested in pursuing a career in journalism? You know, it's interesting because in one way, it seems like that's a separate topic from what we've been discussing, but I actually see them as very related. You referred earlier to this kind of crisis of of uh, men not becoming parents. And a lot of that is because of economic deprivation. People don't have the financial ability to start families. They want to. They don't even have the financial ability to move out of their parents' home until much later in life. And it's creating a great deal of unhappiness in this kind of say millennial generation and 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 even younger, because I think having kids is a natural urge that we have. And when there's this kind of unhappiness and deep satisfaction in life, it translates into everything they do, everything you do. And I think for the journalist class, it is not easy to be a journalist for the vast majority of people on, you know, they're, they're in a, a field that's financially failing. There's layoffs all around them. The work is becoming increasingly unsatisfactory. They can't spend two months doing deep dive investigations of the kind that made journalism so exciting 20, 30, 40 years ago. They have to produce 10 articles a day of clickbait to generate traffic to feed advertisers. And this has turned journalism into this kind of very careless, um, form of activism where people just kind of are expressing their opinion, not really caring any longer about journalistic investigations. And it's creating a lot of confusion in the world because journalism is a really important function in society. It's the thing that is supposed to be telling us what our leaders are doing, what centers of power are doing, how authority is functioning. And when that breaks down, there becomes this kind of division in society because we don't even have the same set of facts that we use to understand the world. And I look at that in, you know, of course, like as one of the things that changes when you become a parent is you don't just look at how the ills of society affect you. You look at how the ills of society are gonna affect your children's life going into the future. And I definitely try and instill in my kids a very strong sense of skepticism to not trust things they absorb in the atmosphere, to not, believe things that they're told just because some institution they're told they should trust has decreed it to be true. I think figuring out things on their own, accepting everything through a lens of skepticism and critical scrutiny is one of the biggest gifts I can give them. And I work a lot on how to do that precisely because of what has happened to journalism. 
Yeah, it seems just like what you're saying there, too, where you don't have a chance to even let a story develop anymore or to investigate it. Yeah, I like it. It's like in the NFL, you used to be able to draft a quarterback and develop him over five years or so. Now, if the guy doesn't do well in his first five games, he's out of there. And it almost seems to be the same with that fast pace. Everyone, that instant gratification that this social media era seems to have uh, really just unleashed on the public here. And, and I wanted to ask you kind of a bit about that, too. Now, uh, how do you do it with the teenagers there? Uh, how do you kind of, because I have my two oldest are teenagers as well. We have four kids all together. Uh, how do you kind of handle or monitor all the social media and the technology and that stuff with your kids? You know, it's hard. I mean, that's for me, one of the biggest challenges. Um, you know, you can go to extremes, right? Like you can try and just fight the tides of the world and say, you're barred from social media. It's It's a toxic influence. But I don't think you're doing your children a big favor if you're depriving them of the ability to connect to what most of the society is talking about, what is shaping them, because you're almost guaranteeing a form of isolation, of kind of exclusion from the rest of the world. So I don't, I personally don't find that to be a viable course of action, even though I have friends who try and I understand the rationale. I have other friends who almost like have created a little mini NSA at home. They have all kinds of devices on their kids' phones that let them spy on their kids. It, they always know where their kids are. They can read all their kids' conversations, um, see what they're browsing. You know, I don't want to create a world where my kids feel like they're constantly being scrutinized and monitored and don't have any privacy. A lot of my work has been about the harms that that does to someone psychologically at the same time these are toxic technologies if you don't you know if you just kind of wash your hands of it and say well you know social media is everywhere my kids are going to use it inevitably and just kind of toss your hands up and say i'm just going to let them you know uh use it however they want and sometimes it's tempting right we're all busy in life and if they're the, your kids are on youtube or tiktok for five hours at a time it's five hours that you don't have to you know watch what they're doing you can kind of outsource your parenting to this technology that even the people who designed it, in fact, particularly the people who designed it, are warning is actually quite dangerous to kids. So what we try and do is limit it through uh, software devices that turn it off or lock it after it's been used for you know an hour and a half or two hours. We try and always have phoneless time on the weekends when we're spending large amounts of time together and no one's allowed to use the phone, including me, which, you know, is the most challenging. <laughs> um, so it's just I think about for me, it's about finding the right balance. You, you can't protect your kids from all the bad things in the world, even if you wish to. It, it has become increasingly harder, Glenn. Just like you said, the hardest part is for myself to not use it, uh, especially doing the podcast. Since I started this, I have grown uh, more addicted to the screen myself while I'm trying to tell my kids uh, to stay away from it. I'm not leading by example as I try to do in other aspects of my life. It's become increasingly harder for me to lead by example with this. So it's definitely a, a, a struggle. And, and I agree with you there, too. You, you, you don't want to hover over every single thing they're searching, but you can't just let them have free reign. So it's a difficult balance uh, for sure. Yeah. And I know the holidays uh, season is upon us here. Do you guys have any kind of traditions that you do with the kids? Any vacation trips or holiday traditions that you carry going on? So there's no Thanksgiving in, in Brazil. Obviously, it's a uniquely American holiday. But I find Thanksgiving to be one of them. I've always found Thanksgiving to be one of the most fulfilling and gratifying holidays because the combination of family purposely traveling far distances to be together combined with the whole concept of gratitude, you know, taking a moment from the rush of our lives to just focus on the things for which we're grateful is one of the most important things to maintain spirituality. So I have taught them about Thanksgiving. My husband likes Thanksgiving. So we don't quite have the whole full on Turkey weekend, but I have imported that. And, uh, you know, I didn't really grow up with with Christmas. My my parents were Jews. They weren't religious Jews, but just culturally, they they weren't connected to Christmas. But for my husband, for my kids, Christmas is an incredibly important holiday. Um, so we just put up the tree today, for example, um, that I used to be very jaded about holidays before I had kids. You know, I hated them. I thought they were annoying. I didn't understand why stores are closed. I didn't understand why people just arbitrarily didn't work for some designated day. You know, I just thought they were pointless. And now I've come to value them because that is like, even if you fail in your efforts to spend a lot of quality time with your family, those are the moments when 
the fact that stores are closed, that offices are closed, that people aren't on the internet, there's not a lot of work to do. It, it in a way, kind of forces you to do what you should do and, and actually want to do, which is just spend quiet time, you know, with your friends and family. So, yeah, I, I think Thanksgiving, but and especially Christmas have become really important parts of our family life. Very cool. Yeah. And kind of a silver lining to the pandemic, too, was that it forced so many families to spend more time together. So I heard that a lot over the last year that families got a chance to reconnect. Fathers that were always on the road got a chance to see what they were missing out on home. So a little bit of a silver lining and what was kind of a tumultuous uh, time yeah, here during the pandemic. Sure. And what's next for you here, Glenn? What kind of goals or plans do you have for yourself? Any books in the future? Any projects that you're working on? What's coming up next for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things to which I've devoted myself journalistically is trying to fortify platforms, journalistic platforms that are free of the tyranny of big tech, the ability to censor and control and regulate. So, you know, I obviously left the media outlet that I formed in 2013, The Intercept in 2020, and I'm now writing at Substack. I recently joined Rumble, which is kind of a free speech competitor to YouTube that's growing very rapidly. I'm on a podcast um, platform called Colin, which is designed to uh, let freedom thrive. I have a book contract. So, you know, my biggest problem with work is uh, figuring out what to prioritize and how not to get too sucked into the um, demands of it. Um, but, you know, I find my work life more exciting than ever, because when you see your work as a cause that brings passion, as opposed to just a burden that you have to do to pay the bills, um, for me, that's when work becomes something that you go toward instead of, you know, being resentful about. And I feel like I'm in that place in my life and, you know, I'm happy about that. Wow. Yeah. Great stuff. Uh, last thing I want to hit you with here, uh, Glenn, I'd love to ask all the dads that I get on the podcast, what type of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about to be father who's out there listening? I think that the most important thing is to give yourself space to make mistakes if you take on this belief that you have to be the perfect father, you're going to drive yourself insane. You know, I remember the best advice I got right before the kids were coming. I talked to a child psychiatrist who himself had adopted two children. I said, I've always been so scared about adopting kids because I feel like I'm not going to be a good father. And I'm going to send my kids into therapy for the next 30 years. And he said, you are going to send your kids into therapy for the next 30 years. Every parent will. You know, there's no such thing as being a good parent. But at the end of the day, if your kids end up loving you, like in that deepest part of who they are and you end up loving them, that is that means it's a complete success. And you just have to accept that given the complexities of human beings and how we interact with one another, there is no perfect answer. Sometimes kids say things and do things and they're all the options are bad. You know, and you have to pick the the least bad one. And so I think you have to be very forgiving of yourself as a parent and ultimately just connect to the love that the parent child relationship uniquely affords. And if you have that, you know, hold on to that and 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 realize how special and valuable that is. Yeah, very well said. I love the message. It's been a lot of fun for me. I got to say, Glenn Greenwald, you're a first class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time here on First Class Fatherhood. Yeah, congratulations on, on doing this podcast. It's a great topic and I'm super honored to be part of it. Thanks for in, uh, inviting me.